The 1997 World Series was the championship series of Major League Baseball's MLB 1997 season. The 93rd edition of the World Series, it was a best-of-seven playoff between the American League AL champion Cleveland Indians and the National League NI champion Florida Marlins. The Marlins, who were underdogs, defeated the Indians, four games to three, to win their first World Series championship. Game 7 was decided in extra innings on a walk-off single hit by Edgar Renteria. The series began on October 18 and ended on October 26 after midnight October 27. Marlins pitcher Livan Hernande was named the World Series Most Valuable Player. The Indians advanced to the World Series by defeating the New York Yankees in the AL Division Series, three games to two, and then the Baltimore Orioles in the AL Championship Series, four games to two. It was Cleveland's second World Series appearance in three years. The Marlins advanced to the World Series by defeating the San Francisco Giants in the NI Division Series, three games to none, and then the Atlanta Braves in the NI Championship Series, four games to two. The Marlins set an MLB record by reaching a World Series in just their fifth season of existence. This was the fourth time in World Series history a Game 7 went into extra innings, and was the most recent occasion until the 2016 World Series, in which the Indians also lost in extra innings. The Marlins Championship made them the first wild card team to ever win the World Series. This was the only World Series that Paul Beeston would preside over as CEO of MLB. The previous four World Series had been presided over jointly by the league presidents first Dr. Bobby Brown and then Gene Badig for the AL, Leonard Coleman for the NI. Summary. NI Florida Marlins 4 versus Al Cleveland Indians 3 Topic Matchups Topic Game 1 The first World Series game in the state of Florida, Game 1 featured a youngster and a veteran facing each other on the mound. Fresh off his NLCS MVP performance, Livan Hernande took the hill for the Marlins and quickly gave up a run in the first thanks to a double by leadoff man B.I.P. Roberts and an RBI single by David Justice. Indian starter Oral Hershiser got by the first two innings unscathed. However, after the Marlins tied the game in the third on Edgar Renteria's RBI groundout with two on, they scored four runs in the fourth. Moises Alou's three-run home run off the left field foul pole put the Marlins up 4–1 and Charles Johnson followed with a home run to make it 5–1. After Manny Ramirez's home run in the fifth cut the lead to 5–2, Hershiser allowed a one-out walk and single in the bottom of the inning before Jeff Conine's RBI single made it 6–2 Marlins. Jeff Juden relieved Hershiser and after a force out at second, threw a ball for wild pitch that let Bobby Bonilla score from third. 
Jim Tomei's home run cut the lead to 7–3 in the sixth, then the Indians got another run in the eighth off of Jay Powell when Marquis Grissom walked with two outs and scored on Brian Giles's double, but Florida closer Rob Nen came in the ninth and got out of a jam by striking out Sandy Alomar Jr. and Tomei with two men aboard. Topic Game Two. Game Two matched up Florida ace Kevin Brown against Chad Ogea, who had lost two games in the ALCS. Both teams scored in the first, thanks to RBI singles by David Justice for the Indians after Omar Vizquel doubled with one out and Jeff Conine for the Marlins with two on. OGEA barely escaped further damage when Moises Alou got under a hanging curveball, but merely flied out to the warning track, missing his second three-run homer in as many nights by inches. After that, OGEA settled in and did not allow any more runs in six and two-thirds innings. Brown pitched well until the fifth when the Indians took the lead by stringing together three singles by Matt Williams, Sandy Alomar Jr., and Marquis Grissom. Later in the inning, with runners on the second and third, BIP Roberts drove in a pair of runs with a single up the middle giving the Tribe a 4-1 lead. The three-run lead ballooned to five when Alomar hit a laser into the left field stands for a two-run home run in the sixth. The Indians' 6-1 win tied the series heading to Cleveland. <laughs> Game 3 Game 3 was a wild affair that ended with the Marlins grabbing a 2–1 series lead. Charles Nagy of the Indians faced Al Letter of the Marlins. Both pitchers fared poorly, with Letter giving up four earned runs in four and two-thirds innings and Nagy gave up five in six innings. In the top of the first, Gary Sheffield started the scoring with a home run to left. In the bottom half, the Indians retaliated with two runs thanks to two broken bat RBI singles by Matt Williams and Sandy Alomar Jr. A bases loaded walk to Sheffield tied the game in the third, before Florida took a 3 2 lead in the fourth on Darren Dalton's home run. However, the Indians got a gift in the bottom of the fourth, when they drew four free passes, then a throwing error by third baseman Bobby Bonilla on Manny Ramirez's single allowed two more runs to score. The Tribe went up 7–3 on Jim Tomei's two-run home run to right in the fifth inning. His home run was nullified in the sixth by Jim Eisenreich's two-run home run that cut the lead to 7–5. In the seventh, Craig Council hit a leadoff single off of Brian Anderson and moved to second on a groundout, then Edgar Rentria's single and Gary Sheffield's double off of Mike Jackson who was charged with a blown save each drove in a run, making the score 7–7. Seven in the ninth, Bonilla drew a lead-off walk off of reliever Eric Plunk and scored on Dalton's single aided by an error that let Dalton go to third. After a strikeout to Alou his third of the night and intentional walk to pinch hitter Cliff Floyd, an error on a pickoff attempt allowed Dalton to score. After Charles Johnson singled, Alvin Mormon relieved Plunk and an error on Council's ground ball allowed Floyd to score. 
After Mormon retired Devon White, a warp to Rentria loaded the bases before Jose Mesa relieved Mormon and allowed two run singles to Sheffield and Bonilla aided by a wild pitch that gave the Marlins at 14–7 lead. In the bottom of the inning, the Indians loaded the bases on a walk and two singles with one out off of Rob Nen before Tony Fernandez's sacrifice fly and Marquis Grissom's single scored a run each, then BIP Roberts' two-run double cut the lead to 14–11, but Omar Vizquel grounded out to end the game. Dennis Cook got the win in relief by tossing a scoreless eighth and Plunk got the loss. This was the highest scoring game for 20 years till the fifth game of the 2017 World Series between the Houston Astros and the Los Angeles Dodgers. Marlins batter Gary Sheffield had five RBIs in the game to lead all batters. Topic Game Four. This back and forth World Series continued that way in Game Four. Both teams were greeted by snow during batting practice and freezing temperatures throughout this contest. The official game time temperature of 38 degrees Fahrenheit, 3.3 degrees Celsius, remains as of 2018 the coldest recorded in World Series history. While as the game progressed, media outlets reported wind chill readings as low as 18 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 7.8 degrees Celsius. Two rookies opposed each other on the mound this night, Jarrett Wright for the Indians and Tony Saunders for the Marlins. In the bottom of the first, Omar Vizquel singled with one out before Manny Ramirez's two-run home run put the Indians up 2–0. Matt Williams then singled with two outs and scored on Sandy Alomar's double. In the third, Ramirez drew a lead-off walk, moved to second on an error and scored on David Justice's single. After another walk, Alomar's single scored Justice. After a third walk loaded the bases, Antonio Alfonsica relived Saunders and allowed an RBI single to Tony Fernandez. The Marlins got on the board in the fourth on Jim Eisenreich's RBI single with two on, then Moises Alou's two-run home run after a walk in the sixth cut the Indians lead to 6–3, to but that was as close as the Marlins got. In the bottom of the inning, Alomar's bases loaded ground out off of Ed Vosberg made it 7–3 Indians. Next inning, Fernande hit a leadoff single, moved to second on a ground out and scored on Brian Giles's single. In the eighth, Williams' two-run home run after a walk capped the game's scoring at 10–3 as the Indians tied the series at two games apiece. Wright allowed three runs in six sharp innings and Brian Anderson wrapped up Wright's win with a three-inning save. <laughs> Game 5 Game 5 was a rematch of Game 1's starting pitchers Livan Hernande and Oral Hershiser. The Marlins struck first when Darren Dalton hit a ground rule double and scored on Charles Johnson's single. After a walk to Craig Council, Devon White's RBI double made it 2–0 Marlins. The Indians cut it to 2–1 in the bottom of the inning when Jim Tomei tripled and scored on Sandy Alomar's single. 
Next inning, Alomar launched a towering three-run home run after two walks to Tomei and Matt Williams to put the Indians up 4–2. In the sixth, Moises Alou hit his second three-run home run off Hershiser in as many games and his third home run of the series to put the Marlins up 5–4. Eric Plunk then walked Craig Council with the bases loaded to force in Jeff Conine, with the run charged to Hershiser. The Marlins added to their lead in the seventh when Alou hit a lead-off single off of Jeff Juden, stole second, moved to third on a groundout, and scored on Johnson's single. Next inning, Alou's single scored pinch runner Alex Arias running for Bonilla with two on off of Jose Mesa extended the lead to 8–4. Livin pitched terrifically in the middle innings, not allowing any runs until the ninth. An error and single put two on with no outs for the Indians. Rob Nen in relief allowed a two-run single to David Justice both of the runs charged to Hernande, then a two-out RBI single to Tomei before Alomar flew out to right to end the game and give the Marlins a 3–2 series lead heading back to Florida. <laughs> game 6. Game 6's attendance of 67,498 was the highest single game attendance for the World Series since Game 5 of the 1959 World Series, when 92,706 people filled the football-oriented Los Angeles Memorial Coliseum. The series returned to the warmer climate of Miami for Game 6. Kevin Brown opposed Chad OGEA again and again Brown inexplicably struggled while OGEA flourished. Chad himself drove in the first two runs with a bases loaded single in the second, and Manny Ramirez hit a sacrifice fly in the third after Omar Vizquel hit a leadoff double and stole third and the fifth after a leadoff double and subsequent single. Darren Dalton's sacrifice fly with two on in the fifth that scored Moises Alou from third gave the Marlins their only run of the game. With the Tribe leading 4–1 in the sixth, OGEA ran into serious trouble. The Marlins put runners on second and third with two out as reliever Mike Jackson replaced OGEA. Marlins catcher Charles Johnson stepped to the plate and proceeded to hit a sharp grounder that was headed for left field and looked like a base hit. Indians shortstop Omar Vizquel, who won the gold glove that year, dove for the ball, grabbed it, sprung to his feet, and hurled a perfect strike to first base just before Johnson arrived. The play ended the threat and broke the Marlins' spirits. In the ninth, closer Jose Mesa wrapped up the win despite allowing a triple to Devon White to tie the series at 3–3. Three three. <laughs> Game 7 For the first time in six years, a seventh game would decide the World Series. Indians manager Mike Hargrove, celebrating his 48th birthday this night, made a significant strategic play prior to the start of the game. The Indians' rotation for the series consisted of Oral Hershiser, the starter and loser of Games 1 and 5, Chad Ogea, the winning pitcher in Games 2 and 6, staff ace Charles Nagy, who received a no decision in the Wild Game 3, and rookie Jarrett Wright, who had won Game 4. 
Based on Wright's performance, Hargrove skipped over Nagy and gave the start to the rookie on three days' rest. Marlins manager Jim Leyland, opting to keep his rotation as it was, sent veteran starter Al Letter out for Game 7. The Marlins managed one hit in the first inning, a double off the bat of Edgar Renteria. That was the only hit Wright gave up through six innings, and the Indians staked him to a 2–0 lead in the third. With nobody out, Jim Tomei walked and Marquis Grissom singled him to second. Pitcher Jarrett Wright sacrificed both men into scoring position. After Letter retired Omar Vizquel for the second out, Tony Fernande singled to drive both runners in for the only runs of the game to that point. Letter was removed after six innings. Leading off the bottom of the seventh for the Marlins, Bobby Bonilla hit Wright's first pitch over the right center field wall for a home run to cut the lead to 2–1. After striking out Charles Johnson and walking Craig Council, Wright was removed from the game in favor of Paul Assenmacher who was scheduled to pitch to Cliff Floyd. Marlins manager Jim Leyland elected to send Kurt Abbott to the plate after the pitching change, and Asenmacher retired him on a fly ball, then got Devon White swinging to end the inning. In the top of the ninth inning, Cleveland again threatened. After Antonio Alfonsica walked Matt Williams to lead off the inning and Sandy Alomar Jr. reached on a fielder's choice to take Williams off the bases, Felix Heredia gave up a single to Tomei which advanced Alomar to third. He was then pulled in favor of closer Rob Nen, inducing a ground ball from Grissom to Rentria at shortstop, who elected to throw Alomar out at home, thanks in part to a great pick and tag by Johnson. He then got Brian Giles to fly out to end the inning. The Indians sent closer Jose Mesa to the mound to try to win the series in the bottom of the ninth inning. Moises Alou led off with a single, and Bonilla struck out swinging on a 3–2 pitch that would have been ball four. Nevertheless, just four strikes away from losing the World Series, Johnson lined a 1–2 fastball into right field, moving Alou to third. With runners on first and third and one out, Craig Council fought off a low, inside fastball from Mesa, lining it into deep right field. Manny Ramirez caught the ball on the warning track to make it two outs, but Alou easily scored from third to tie the game. Although Mesa retired Jim Eisenreich to send the game to extra innings and held the Marlins without a run in the tenth, his blown save would open him to criticism for years to come. After Nen struck out the side in the top of the tenth, Mesa was lifted after giving up back-to-back -back one out singles for Game 3 starter Nagy, who got a Lou to fly out to end the threat. After walking Williams, leading off the top of the eleventh inning, Jay Powell retired Cleveland in order thanks to an alert fielder's choice on a sacrifice bunt by Alomar, which Powell fielded and threw out the lead runner at second, followed by a Jim Tomei inning ending double play. Nagy took to the mound to face Florida in the bottom half of the eleventh. Bonilla led off with a single to center. Greg Zahn nearly caused a double play by popping his bunt attempt directly to Nagy. However, Bonilla was able to get back to first safely. Council followed with a ground ball that should have produced an inning-ending double play. 
Instead, the ball was misplayed by Fernande, slipping under his glove and into right field, and Bonilla advanced to third on the error. After Nagy loaded the bases with an intentional walk to Eisenreich, he got White to ground into a fielder's choice to Fernande, who elected to not go for the double play but instead quickly threw Bonilla out at the plate for the second out. The next batter was Renteria, with the bases loaded and two outs in the bottom of the 11th inning of Game 7 of the World Series, he timed an 0-1 slider from Nagy and lined it up the middle out of reach of both Nagy who was so close his glove even touched the ball, and between middle infielders Fernande and gold glove shortstop Vizquel. An exuberant counsel scored from third, and jumped on home plate with his fists in the air in celebration—with the series winning run. Renteria, in jubilation, removed his helmet with tears in his eyes before touching first base, having hit a World Series winning walk-off single. After Game 7, the trophy presentation, usually taking place in the winning team's locker room regardless of venue, took place on the field for the first time ever before the crowd of 67,204. It was presided over by then chairman of the executive committee Bud Selig, who first did the honours in 1995 and would officially become commissioner of baseball in 1998. This is now a standard procedure whenever the champions are the home team of the deciding game the only exception being 1999 when the New York Yankees chose to celebrate in their locker room. <laughs> Composite box 1997 World Series 4 to 3 Florida Marlins NL over Cleveland Indians AL Topic Aftermath Livan Hernande was named the most valuable player of the 1997 World Series Chad Ogea became the first pitcher since Mickey Lolich in 1968 to have at least two hits and two RBIs in a World Series. The Marlins won despite not having Alex Fernandez, their number two starter, who did not pitch due to a rotator cuff injury. Soon after Game 7 was complete, rumors on the Internet started to spread that the 1989 four years before the Florida Marlins made their debut film Back to the Future Part II accurately predicted their 1997 World Series victory. In reality, the movie stated that, in 2015, a Miami team with an alligator mascot would lose to the Chicago Cubs in the World Series. Ironically, the actual Cubs 2015 season also ended on October 21, and in a four-game sweep, but this time, they lost to the New York Mets in that year's NLCS. On October 31, 1997, most of the fan favorites of the 1997 Marlins were traded, including Moise Zalou, who was traded to the Houston Astros, and Al Letter to the New York Mets, in a fire sale so infamous that it has come to synonymize the term in the baseball world. The Marlins also lost Jeff Conine to the Royals and Darren Dalton when he retired. World Series MVP Hurler Livan Hernande, however, stayed with the team for two more years. 
The Marlins had a record of 54 to 108 in 1998, the worst performance ever by a defending World Series champion. As a result, these Marlins are mockingly referred to as the first renter team to win the World Series. Midway through the 1998 season, the Marlins would trade Jim Eisenreich, Bobby Bonilla, Gary Sheffield, and Charles Johnson to the Dodgers for Todd Zile and Mike Piazza. Piazza would be traded shortly after to the Mets in return for prospects, one of which was Preston Wilson. Jim Leyland, responding to reports that he would retire if the Marlins won the World Series, told NBC during the celebration, "...my wife doesn't like me that much. I can't retire." However, he quit in the wake of their pitiful performance in 1998. He managed the Colorado Rockies in 1999, then scouted for several years before joining the Detroit Tigers as manager in 2006 and taking them to the World Series and losing in five games. Marlins owner H. Wayne Huizenga, who dodged questions about selling the team during the on-field celebration, ultimately sold the team to John W. Henry after the 1998 season. Henry in turn sold it to former Montreal Expos owner Jeffrey Laurier in 2001 as part of a deal to purchase the Boston Red Sox. Loria would return the team to a World Series victory in 2003. That season started with only one of the 1997 World Series players left on the roster, pitcher Rick Helling. Helling was traded mid-season to the Texas Rangers. However, the team traded with the Baltimore Orioles for Jeff Conine. Conin would be the only 1997 Marlin to participate in the 2003 World Series victory. Huizenga continued to be the team's landlord at what is now Hard Rock Stadium until 2008, when he sold it with the Miami Dolphins to Stephen M. Ross. The failure of Jose Mesa to save Game 7 ultimately ignited a heated feud with teammate Omar Vizquel. In Vizquel's autobiography, the veteran shortstop called Mesa a choker. The two men ended their longtime friendship. Mesa later vowed to hit him every time. He faced him, and also stated that he wanted to kill Vizquel. Though Mesa did not actually bean Vizquel every time he subsequently faced him, he did hit him with pitches at least twice. Game 7 also caused a scheduled Chicago Bears-Miami Dolphins game to be postponed to Monday night. It was seen on ABC in the Chicago and Miami markets, and was intended to air on Fox. The rest of the nation received the scheduled Green Bay Packers New England Patriots game, the only time a rematch of a previous season's Super Bowl aired on ABC. It was also the first time in ten years a football game in this case the Denver Broncos at the Minnesota Vikings was moved to Monday night because of the World Series. Also, largely as a result of over 67,000 attending every World Series game played in Pro Player Stadium in Miami, the 1997 World Series became just the second to draw a total attendance of over 400,000 for the entire series. 
The only other World Series to draw more than 400,000 in attendance was the 1959 World Series, which had three of its six games played at the Los Angeles Coliseum, which drew over 92,000 for each game played at the Coliseum in that World Series. The total attendance of 403,627 is the second largest in World Series history, only to the attendance of 420,784 in 1959. Miami and Cleveland have celebrated championships in the 19 years since, in addition to the Marlins' second World Series championship in 2003, the Miami Heat won NBA championships in 2006, 2012 and 2013, while the Cleveland Cavaliers won the 2016 NBA Finals just eight days after the NHL's Columbus Blue Jackets affiliate, the Lake Erie Monsters, now the Cleveland Monsters won the AHL's Calder Cup ending a 52-year championship drought for their city. With the exception of 2006 Akron, Ohio native LeBron James played on each of the aforementioned NBA championship teams. As previously mentioned, the Indians also made it to the World Series in 2016, but in losing to the Chicago Cubs in seven games, they replaced the Cubs who until then had not won the series since 1908 as the team with the longest championship drought, having last won in 1948. Topic: Radio and television coverage. This marked the first time since 1988 that NBC televised a World Series in its entirety. In 1995, NBC televised games two, three, and six, while rival ABC televised games one, four, and five having split that series since ABC was promised the strike cancelled 1994 World Series. Both networks had announced prior to the 1995 season, that they were bailing out what was initially a six-year-long revenue-sharing joint venture with Major League Baseball called, "...the Baseball Network." Starting with the 1996 World Series, Fox and NBC would alternate World Series broadcast rights for the next five seasons, with NBC broadcasting in odd-numbered years and Fox in even-numbered years. This arrangement ended in 2001, when Fox got exclusive broadcast rights to the World Series, and still does today. NBC's West Coast president Don Olmeyer disturbed Major League Baseball when he publicly wished the World Series to end in a four-game sweep so that it wouldn't derail NBC's fall entertainment schedule. Game 5 fell on a Thursday, which had long been the highest rated night on NBC's schedule, if not on all of television. Midway through Game 2, "'Surprise Guest' Joe DiMaggio joined NBC's Bob Costas, Joe Morgan and Bob Uecker in the television booth. DiMaggio joked that Morgan was a "'Hall of Famer' and Costas a "'Future Hall of Famer' but he didn't know what to think of when it came to Uecker. Ironically enough, the Baseball Hall of Fame would present Euchre with its Ford C. Frick Award several years later. Also working for NBC's coverage were Jim Gray, who served as field reporter, and Ray Knight, Ron McLean and Ahmed Rashad who alternated as dugout reporters. 
Meanwhile, Hannah Storm and Keith Olbermann served as pregame hosts. Storm along with Jim Gray and Amhad Rashad covered the celebration on the field following Game 7. Also following Game 7, McLean interviewed Mike Hargrove, and along with Keith Olbermann interviewed Indians players from their locker room. McLean only worked games 3, 4, 5 and 7 on loan from CBC Sports in Canada as he was under Hockey Night in Canada contract. This was the last World Series broadcast on CBS Radio, which had covered the World Series consecutively since 1976. ESPN Radio would take over the national radio contract for Major League Baseball the following year. Vin Scully and Jeff Torborg were CBS Radio's announcers for the series the latter had once managed the Indians and would later manage the Marlins. This was Scully's 11th and final World Series call for CBS Radio, and seventh consecutive since he rejoined the network following NBC's 1989 loss of baseball. It was also Scully's 25th and final World Series broadcast overall, including 14 others he called for NBC and the Los Angeles Dodgers. Torborg would continue to call games for Fox Television until the end of the 2000 season, working alongside John Rooney and Chip Carey, when he elected to return to managing and was hired by the Montreal Expos. Game 7 was the final Major League Baseball game called by longtime Indians radio announcer Herb Score, as he retired at season's end. Score's broadcast partner, Tom Hamilton, would take over as lead announcer and he remains in that position as of the 2017 season. It also marked the final game carried by Indians flagship station WKNR 1220. The broadcast rights would be moved to WTAM for the 1998 season. Topic: See also Cleveland Sports Curse 1997 Japan Series <laughs>